There's an old story about a devout older lady that lived in a house right beside a belligerent, mean-spirited atheist. She would always have her morning devotions on her front porch where she would pray to God and sing songs and read from her Bible. And this, for some reason, just gulled the atheist um, that lived beside her. One day, he happened to hear her prayer as she was asking God to send groceries. She had missed her check that month, and, and she was uh, needing food, and so she asked that God would supply. Well, he thought it would be funny, so he went to the grocery store and bought two sacks of groceries and put it on her porch. Then the next day at her devotions, oh, she's just praising God for the food until he jumped out. Aha! See, there is no God. I brought those groceries. And he stood there in his moment of glory. And she just side-eyed him and went on with their prayer and said, Yes, Lord, thank you for giving me groceries and having the devil pay for it. <laughs> well, you might have gone through times of testing. Maybe it wasn't an atheistic neighbor, but maybe it was just someone that made your... In fact, our faith is always going to be tested. And a lot of us have experienced that with people. You know, maybe it was a neighbor that was hard to get along, or a boss that expected too much, or a friend that only showed up when he needed something. And, and it's people that are trying. I remember uh, one time working at camp, uh, you know, staying there and, and doing some work and thinking, you know, camp is a whole lot more fun when there's nobody here, you know. It's dealing with people that sometimes uh, causes issues. But sometimes it's not people. Sometimes it's just life. It's when we lose a, a job or, uh, you know, something breaks down and we worry about having to pay for it. I remember one of our members uh, one time had his car break down, his air conditioner break down, something else at home broke down, and he said, all my worldly possessions have turned against me. We've all experienced that uh, at some uh, point. Sometimes it's just life that is a test of our faith. But sometimes it is having to deal with the frailties of our bodies, dealing with chronic pain that we can't get on top of, or it's a sudden sickness that just took us by surprise, or just the issues of getting older. But then there's times when what really tests our faith is the man or woman in the mirror. It's our own personal failings. It's our imperfections and flaws. As Roger says, while love doesn't fail, we often do and disappoint ourselves and then face the consequences of our... We are going to find that life is going to test our faith, that sometimes our faith and what we see in the world around us just doesn't match up. Now, there's some that tell you that's not right, that if you're living the right kind of life then God will take care of you, that God wants all of his children. And by the way, we are kids of the king. God wants all of his children to prosper, to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. And if we just live the right way and do the right things and give the right way, particularly, that God will make sure that we don't face any testing. I don't know where they get that, but it's certainly not from the Bible. As Paul is returning from the first missionary journey, he plants all of these churches, and then he does the reverse route. He visits them all again on the way home. And one of the things he tells them, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. You've just started this Christian life. I don't want you to think this is going to make everything in your life easy. Jesus himself told the apostles shortly before in his own crucifixion, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Yes, we can take heart because Jesus wins. Jesus overcomes the world. But as long as we're in this world, we're going to face testing. We're going to face trouble. We're going to face trials. And sometimes the only way that gets us through them is realizing that Jesus has overcome uh, and we one day will overcome with them. Peter writes to his uh, readers, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come to, or, to you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. You know, when you're going through hardships, don't think, well, God, this wasn't part of the deal. And God assures us, when I sent my son to earth, he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Do you think you're going to be less acquainted? If you follow my son, 
Don't you think you're going to struggle through some of the things that he struggled through? Don't think it strange. Your faith is going to be tested. Today we start a brand new series where we're going tested faith, where we're going to look at some of what the Bible says about the fact that our faith is going to be tested. And we're going to focus primarily on what we generally call the general epistles. Now, the, of course, the general epistles are more important than the lieutenant epistles. Now, they're called general epistles because they're written to the church generally. Most of Paul's writings were directed at one particular church or one particular person. The general epistles of James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd and 3rd John, are directed at the church in general. And one of the themes that they keep coming back to is this idea that your faith is going to be tested. Now, we're not going to study the, uh, all of those epistles going through verse by verse. What we're going to do is, is sort of look at, highlight, uh, unpack some of the texts in those epistles that talk about how our faith is tested. And the first one that comes to mind is probably the best known. It's where James starts his book by telling us that we can be joyful because our faith is tested. James 1 basically is going to make four different points that talks about how our faith is tested. First, he says that testing grows our faith. So he starts, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Now, he doesn't say it's a good thing that your faith is tested. He doesn't even say, be happy that your faith is tested. But what he says is that you can consider it, or some translations, you can count it as joy. It's kind of an accounting term. Life gives us uh, lemons. And, and we have to deal with these troubles. And, and so they line up in the trial column. James says, take those and Move them to the column of lemonade. Move them to the column of opportunities that God gives you to grow your faith. That as you deal with trials, that, you know, the old saying, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, that God uses those trials as ways of toughening you and, and causing you uh, to build calluses that makes your faith stronger. Now, there are other ways that our faith can be tested. In fact, uh, Proverbs 27 says, Fire tests the purity of silver and gold, but a person is tested by being praised. Remember, Jesus said, Beware when everybody talks good of you. <laughs> well, you know, the, the proverb uh, writer here warns us that you can be tested when everything goes well. You can be really, your, your character is tested when everybody likes you and says good things about you. And so we say, God, let me be tested like that. <laughs> well, we don't get to choose how it is that we're going to be tested. James says, whenever trials come, notice he doesn't say if trials come. He assumes that the characteristic format of the Christian life is there are going to be times there are going to be seasons of being tested and that we should see that joyfully and as an opportunity for God to bless us. So count it all joy whenever those trials come because they are going to come. The second point he makes is that God helps us during those times of testing. Now, what he says in verse 5 if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who generously who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. So we are to ask, and God will give us wisdom. We like to take this as a general promise that any time that we lack understanding, if we pray, that God will help us to understand it. One of the blessings of going to a Christian college is that we started every class with prayer. Not just Bible classes, but biology classes. And in all classes, we're started with a, a, a prayer. And there's a, a, a real famous day when the professor asked on somebody to lead the prayer. And so they began to pray and they said, And Lord, please be with us today as we take this test. And somebody in the back of the room screamed, Test? What test? Yeah, it's, it's uh, good for us to pray for God's blessings on us. But you know what would help? Studying. You know, that would help. 
You know, don't put it off on God to give us wisdom when, when we can uh, sometimes gain that. In fact, we understand that uh, most wisdom, as we're, as we're used to using it, comes from experience, the experience of doing things the wrong way. You know, we gain wisdom sometimes just by living life and learning the lessons that God provides. But here he is saying that, okay, you're going to count it all joy when uh, trials come. How can I do that? That doesn't make sense, Lord. Well, if you will ask, I will give you the wisdom to know how you can count it as joy. You know, that's the context that he's dealing with. Not that, you know, God will uh, allow you to understand the theory of relativity if you just pray hard enough. But that he will help you to deal with your struggles, your trials, your temptations if you will simply pray and, and be very uh, faithful in that prayer. In other words, believing that, it, because if you doubt, that won't help, he goes on to say. Um, now, that's not necessarily saying that God will give you a, a bolt from the blue to, uh, you know, that all, you pray and God all of a sudden, boom, I, I understand everything. Old Star Trek episode where, uh, you know, Spock puts, or actually Dr. McCoy puts this helmet on and this alien life form helps him to understand how to do a brain transplant. Oh, yes, it's easy now. A child could do it. God doesn't bolt out of the blue wisdom like that most of the time. Hey, if God wants to do that, he certainly can. And there are certain times when the only way that we can explain something that happens to us is that God did it. But you know, God sometimes works through friends. We're praying and struggling with a problem and trying to understand what's going on. And all of a sudden, our brothers and sisters of Christ rally to us and they pray with us, and they commiserate with us, and sometimes through their life experience, because perhaps they've gone through something similar, they can grant the wisdom that uh, we've asked God for. And, and sometimes it's study. You know, God speaks to us today through his word, right? And so if we're struggling with something and we begin to study and open ourselves up to God's word, we listen to people that are learned in, in situations like we're dealing with that teach us from God's word, perhaps that's how God will give us the wisdom to understand. And sometimes maybe it's more formally in counseling where we're so overwhelmed with a problem. What happens with pain and what happens with crisis is it takes over our life, and we don't have the perspective to look at things afresh. And we need someone sometimes to walk us through it. There's even times when perhaps because what we're dealing with clouds our minds to the point where there's a, you know, chemicals misfiring in our brain, we may need help with medication. God works through all kinds of things. The promise of James is, is that if we will pray, God will give us the wisdom to deal with whatever trial and struggle that we are doing with. The third point that he makes is that sometimes it just takes time. Sometimes we do have that aha moment, but it's years after we went through the experience. What he says here is, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Okay, blessed is the one that perseveres. Sometimes we just have to put up with what we're going through. We don't get any bolts from the blue. We don't get any great insights. God doesn't explain why it is until later in life, once we have persevered, we look back and then we can see how we have been blessed and strengthened. We may still say, man, I wish I had never gone through that. But having gone through it, I have learned this and this and this, and God has brought me closer to himself. Paul says in Romans 8 and verse 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. There are things in our life we go through that the only out, the only way of dealing with it is to remember that heaven will surely be worth it all. That sometimes we can, we can only get through today by imagining what God is going to do in a glorious future. That God has promised to make everything new, to wipe away every tear. And sometimes there are struggles that we go through that simply make no sense to us until we get on the other side of it. That sometimes just trusting God is all that we can do. In fact, when we're going through some difficulty, some trial, some, some uh, hard time in our life, and we ask God for help, he can do that in one of three ways. 
Sometimes he heals, right? Sometimes he takes, because that's what we usually pray for. At least I hope we trust God enough to pray for. God, take this away. And then sometimes, boom, the tests come back and whatever it is we were concerned about aren't there. Sometimes God heals. And if we don't believe, remember, the Bible is there to tell us how powerful God is, not how powerful he used to be. We still need to trust that God can heal, that God can take away our struggles and difficulties and hardships. But very often, he doesn't take it away. What he ends up giving us is the power to cope with our situation as it is, to the point where now, though we understand this is still a thorn in the flesh, I know how I can deal with it, and it doesn't seem to be such a disadvantage now. Paul prayed three times. So that means he prayed, and then later he prayed some more, and then a third time he prayed one more time for God to take away this thorn in the flesh. We don't have any idea what that is. Paul, in uh, some of his letters, talks about what large letters he signs the end of the letter with, causing some to think maybe he had eyesight problems. Uh, I tend to think he was hard of hearing because that seems to be a big thorn in the flesh. But what he decides is God teaches him, my grace is sufficient, my strength is made evident in weakness. So your witness to the world, Paul, is made stronger because of the strength I have in you despite your weakness. And so that gave Paul a whole new perspective. So no, his thorn in the flesh isn't gone, but he's able to cope in such a way that it brings him closer to God, and Paul no longer sees it as a disadvantage. And there are some things that can happen in our lives that are really awful at the time, but later we learn ways to cope, and we still look back and say, yeah, that was still bad. I don't want to go through that again, but I praise God that he has showed me how to deal with it now. I've been given the power to cope. But, you know, sometimes God doesn't heal, doesn't take away the struggle. Sometimes he doesn't uh, find us, give us the, the strength to cope in such a way that that's no longer an issue for us in our lives. So sometimes he just gives us the power to endure. Sometimes he just gives us the strength to put up with whatever it is that's causing our issues, our problems, our struggles. And, uh, and that's when we remember what it is that God is going to do in us one day as he makes everything new. Remember what he told the church, in, in a little church in Smyrna that was so little and so beat up on. He said, do not be afraid of what you are about to, to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. Notice he doesn't say, don't worry, I'm going to take that test away. No, what he says is, you will suffer persecution for 10 days, a longer but finite period of time. There's going to be a time when you're going to suffer persecution. Be faithful even to the point of death. The victory that some of these Christians were going to win over the persecution was being killed and waking up in the arms of Jesus. From our perspective, we would say, Lord, you know, it would be even more dramatic if you destroyed all my enemies and restored me to my former life. Um, But he's telling us that sometimes we just have to be faithful unto death because the promise he gives us is the victor's crown, the crown of life. So sometimes he just gives us uh, the, the power to... And we don't even recognize that until we look at it from down the road. The fourth point he makes is when you get a bad grade on the test, don't blame the teacher. You know, when we sin, he says, don't blame God. Now, I've got a lot of teachers here. That's what kids do, right? We get a bad grade. James says, don't blame God for your failures. So in verses 13 and 14, when tempted, no one should say, God has tempted me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Now, it's interesting what our English translations try very hard sometimes uh, to cover up and understand why. Because the word that James uses can be translated either as trial, hardship, difficulty, or temptation to sin. Um, and so our English translations usually have the first part, uh, count it all joy when you go through many trials. He uses the word trial. And, and then later, you know, blessed is the one who has been tested, uses the word test. 
And here, when you're tempted, let's see, what we need to understand is uh, that's all the same thing. We are tested. We are always going to be tempted. And what James is warning us here is don't think that when you fail the test and are led into sin that it's God that has done that. So is God involved when we are tested slash tempted? Well, he was involved when Abraham went through the test. Uh, Hebrews 11 and verse 17, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. Abraham passed the test, but the interesting point is that God is held responsible for that test. Sometimes God tests us. And it's the same word, by the way. The reason it's bold is James. it's the same word that James uses in our text. Um, and when we have been uh, one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet did not sin. That's Jesus, right? We have a high priest that understands our infirmities because he was, same word, he was tr- went through trials, he was tempted, he was tested in every way like us, but he never failed the test. And then, who is it that tests us? Is God involved? Well, we know that it is Satan who is the tempter, right? So I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you and that our labors might have been in vain. Again, the same word is used and applied uh, to Jesus. I mean, to Satan. Jesus is tempted by the tempter. And we're tempted in all the same ways. But when we are tempted, because here's what happens. We go through trials and hardships and difficulties and things that are not evil in and of themselves but are hard and unfair and a real trial. What happens every time is Satan comes in behind that and says, like Job's wife said to him, why don't you curse God and die? Satan uses our trials and our temptations, uh, our trials and difficulties to try to get us to do what's wrong. And so then they become temptations to sin. And James is saying, when that happens, don't blame God. They didn't swoop in and take the test away. Because all of us are tempted when we are dragged away by our own evil desires and enticed. Some things are just not evil in themselves. Uh, like cheesecake. Now we use that language. Of, you know, I'll be able to say that I'm tempted by cheesecake. Well, actually, to be honest, I'm tempted by the second and third piece uh, of cheesecake. But you know, when when I when I give in and I go back and I get that second piece and get that third piece, I can't say, well, you know, if Lynn hadn't have made cheesecake. Go ahead and test me in this and see if I can re- resist. If England had made it, when we're tempted, don't say that it's God's fault. I ate that second and third piece of cheesecake because I was dragged away by my own lusts and enticed, right? It's not evil that we go through difficulties. It's evil when Satan uses those difficulties to turn us away from God. Here's what... Paul said, familiar text, God is faithful. You know, we're called to be faithful, but always the basis of that is that God is faithful. God is faithful. He will not let you be, that's our word again, tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will always provide a way out so that you can endure it. That's the promise of God. There's always that way of escape, as the King James puts it. Now, what is he really saying here? Does that mean, uh, okay, when I go through a hardship, health issue, a people issue, whatever, when I go through one of those, that God is going to find a way of escape for me? Or does that mean um, if, if Satan tempts me to do wrong, God is going to give me a way of escape? Absolutely. It applies to all of those. God is always going to give me a way that I can endure it. He may give me, he may heal me from it. He may give me coping mechanisms to where it's not a problem anymore, or he may simply provide a way that I can endure it. But the way of escape 
is always there. I grew up in a church that stressed the five steps of salvation. Hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. Now, actually, that's based on Walter Scott's five-finger exercise way back in the early 1800s or mid-1800s. He would go places and he would invite people, come to the courthouse tonight where I'm going to be preaching, and here's what I'm going to be preaching. Believe, repent, confess, be baptized, and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That was the original five steps. Uh, and, and Scott's, these are things that we do to uh, respond to the gospel. Baptism is where we are completely uh, bend our will and simply submit, because we don't baptize ourselves, somebody baptizes us. And then the gift of the Holy Spirit is what God does. Well, we've never been real sure about that Holy Spirit thing, and so we kind of dropped him off the little finger and added one uh, for the thumb uh, sort of thing. That's, you know, we, we tend to stress what we do. And so the five steps started to be, in our minds anyway, the things that I do to save myself. When in reality, there's only one step in the plan of salvation, and Jesus took it at the cross. We simply respond in faith, in obedience, in, in order to what God has done. We don't save ourselves. He saves us. And that's kind of a problem that we've looked at the, the, these steps. But there's another problem. And that is, when you take a step, in, your, in the way that we think about it anyway, we're done with it. So we, I guess I could go down and come back up, and I won't do that. You, you just take that first step, and I've done that. I've heard the gospel, and I take the next step, I believe it. Then I'm ready for the third step. I repent of my sin, and, and then I'm ready for the fourth step, and then the fifth step. And the idea is, I've done those, and now I've saved. When in reality, those are all decisions, those are all steps that we make every day. Those are not things that we do and are complete. I decide to believe every day. I have to get up every morning and decide, today, I'm going to believe, and I'm going to live like my faith is real. Every day, I have to repent. You know, we sometimes... You know, like Roger did this morning. Oh, we fail. I did, I said it a little earlier. I'm not perfect. So repent. If we continue to fail as we recognize we do, then repentance is something that we must live in every day. It's not a step we take once and then we're done with. Confess. Jesus says, he who confesses me before men, he's not talking about walking up one time in front of the church and saying, yep, I believe. He's saying we live our lives. Peter broke this command, by the way, when he was put on the spot and he told those people outside the trial of Jesus, I don't even know the man. I swear on him, I don't know the man. Are we put in situations where we have to decide we're going to own up to our faith that we're going to fess Jesus or deny him? And while we don't continue to be baptized, Every week, we reenact that initial baptism as we reenact the cross in another way. We eat of the bread and drink of uh, the cup that shows that we are reaffirming that I am going to live this story every day. Our faith is going to be tested continually in different ways. It's going to be tested intellectually. It's going to be tested emotionally. It's going to be tested through the hard times that we go through. And so that we're going to have to make the decision that we trust God over and over and over again. That He is the one that is faithful. And what that means is we are constantly looking around for the trap door that provides our way of escape for any trial, difficulty, or temptation that we go through. The question is, are you going to live this faith this week? Are you going to believe for today? And then are you going to believe for tomorrow? And are you going to live like you believe for Christ Jesus? That's the challenge this morning. If there's something in your life that you need particular help or prayer with, our elders will be at the back of the auditorium as we sing this next song. And uh, if 
particularly you're, you are ready to take that first initial step of faith to repent and confess and be baptized so that you can do all of that over again each day as you live your life for Jesus. As we sing this next song, go to the back and let the elders know whatever it is that you need. Let's stand and sing.